This is the Untold Italy Travel Podcast and you're listening to episode number 206. Ciao a tutti and benvenuti to Untold Italy, the travel podcast where you go to the towns and villages, mountains and lakes, hills and coastlines of Bella Italia. Each week, your host, Katie Clark, takes you on a journey in a search of magical landscapes, history, culture, wine, gelato, and of course, a whole lot of pasta. If you're dreaming of Italy and planning future adventures there, you've come to the right place. Buongiorno everyone, happy new year, buon anno. I hope you've all had a great start to the year and are excitedly planning your trips to Italy in 2024. On this episode, we're starting a series about Italian wine regions because apart from being a delicious accompaniment to your meal, wine is such an important part of Italian culture, whether you drink it or not. There are over 450 recognised grape varieties grown across Italy's 20 regions and they create beautiful blends of wine that are designed to match perfectly with local dishes. And apart from the grapes, some other things that are important to winemaking, the terroir or landscape, the soil, climate and more. So having an appreciation of local Italian wines is to also delve deep into what makes each micro region so special and it's also a great touch point and way to travel around the country. We're going to start this series off with a variety known as the king of Italian wines, Barolo. Found in the beautiful northern region of Piedmont, which borders France and Switzerland, this wine region is very special and one of the most celebrated in Italy. Our Italian wine experts, Olivia Windsor and Andrea Mitibua from Italian Wine Tales, are joining us to tell us all about Barolo, and I can't think of a better couple to do that. Andrea was born and raised in Piedmont, and in fact, when I was in Piedmont last year, we visited a winery where his grandmother had played with the winemaker's children when she was very small. Olivia also has strong wine connections in Piedmont, having taken part in Vendemia, or the wine harvest there. And she also leads our food and wine-focused small group tours of Piedmont, which of course feature many tastes of Barolo. So I'm very excited to chat about Barolo with them. Let's dive in. Antoinati, welcome back to the Untold Italy podcast, Olivia and Andrea. Ciao, Katie. Ciao. Hi, everyone. (laughs) It's so good to have you back again. And this time we're going to be chatting with you about the Barolo wine region. And it feels quite fitting that we start with Barolo. Can you tell our listeners why and a little bit about you and Italian wine tales if they're listening to you for the first time? Well, uh, Italian Wine Tales is this blog that we created uh, this year. It's a way to approach Italian wines in a comprehensive way, but without being too snobbish about it. Sometimes Italian wines and wine world in general can be a bit overwhelming to approach if you are new to it. So we want to give you an easy way into the wine so that you can learn more about it. Yeah, and why Katie mentions that Piedmont is a fitting region to start with uh, is because Andrea is actually from Piedmont. I am. So, yeah, you can tell them where you're from. Well, exactly. for everyone that is listening and has not good understanding of where Piedmont is, we're talking about uh, west of Venice and Milan and north of Rome and Florence, so northwest of Italy. It's a beautiful hilly region nestled between the mountains and these beautiful hills. And Barolo, where the wine takes the name from this beautiful little village on top of a hill, it's the heart of this hilly region called Le Langue. And it's a beautiful, romantic, fairy tale place. Uh, I really suggest you to go and visit. Yeah, Andrea's got some family history from around the region. So he was born in Turin, but on his mum's side of the family, everyone was from La Mora, which is another beautiful town nearby. Yes. (laughs) It's so pretty and it was so wonderful exploring Barolo with you last year. Liv and Andrea's mum, I just (laughs) love the landscape and the northern Italian atmosphere. It's so different to the south. Not better or worse, just different. It's it's refined and it's elegant and it's got a little bit of uh, 
oh, I don't want to say French flavour because that'll just Andrea won't talk to me ever again. <laughs> it's got a more northern European aspect about it and it's very different to southern Italy. Now, so everyone can picture what it's like. Can you describe the area and place it for people so they can imagine what it's like? So the area is about 2,000 hectares of vineyards. So imagine this beautiful scenery of hills covered with vineyards, um, as I said, 2,000 hectares. And to give you an idea, the Bourgogne region of France, which is very famous, is 29,000 hectares of vineyards. So it's quite small compared very to other. Very small and compact. <laughs> it's quite compact, but it's beautiful because since it's so compact and it's so full of vineyards, you can really lose yourself in this beautiful landscape of vineyards, like little towns sitting on top of these hills. And these towns are very small. They're little villages, but they're full of history. And each little town, it's famous because they produce a different kind of wine oftentimes. Even if they're very close to each other, they produce different kind of wines and they're all very good. We're going to talk about it now, but and really, they're very, very good. Mm, and the Barolo region specifically um, is obviously producing the Barolo wine, but some other varieties like Nebbiolo um, and some other ones yes. that we'll talk about a little bit later. But, yeah, it's a very, I think, different to Chianti, which is quite spread out. Piedmont's Barolo region is it's really close together, so you can actually visit a lot when you're there and see a lot of different wineries in a short amount of time. And aesthetically speaking it's very different because you can see the alps in the background so you've got you know the beautiful rolling hills and the alps which is amazing it really is amazing and when i was there with you last year all i was going wow look at those mountains and the snow you can see the snow on the mountains and i've got all these video footage of out the car window looking at the beautiful alps in the background and that's something that you probably don't see too many other places and I think that's very special and also I was a little bit surprised because everything is so close together because maybe uh yeah having that experience in Chianti but also at home here in Australia where you have like vast vast vineyards but it's not there's um very tiny small plots of vines and what is completely amazing about it is you can make a wine from the grapes on one side of the hill and it'll taste completely different <laughs> to the wine made from the grapes on the other side of the hill and I find that really fascinating. It is and we've got some tips about which side of the hill is for who as well later on. Yeah. <laughs> oh okay so let's let's go into some detail we've so we've got a bit of an overview we understand about the region so what is it famous for what's the big one? Barolo wine, the king of uh, Italian wines. So this is the big one. It can be confusing because Barolo is the name of the wine and also the name of the town itself. Both are worth visiting slash trying. But where Barolo wine is produced is not just the town of Barolo. So there are 11 towns or villages and that area is where it's produced. So the most important towns would be Barolo, La Mora, um, Verduno. Serra Lunga d'Alba, mm. Castiglione Faletto, and Alba, Monforte. of course, which is not strictly in, in the Barolo wine region, but is the biggest town in the area. And it's also very famous for truffles. Yeah, that region doesn't produce Barolo wine, though, but it is definitely a town worth visiting. It's the capital of Lange. Yeah, yeah. but you can obviously try This is what I liked about that area as well there's a, in each town they've got little wine tasting rooms so even if you didn't really want to go to a winery don't worry you can taste everything there <laughs> they are these cute wine tasting rooms everywhere that you go okay so let's talk about the wine so we know barolo is made in the Lange, which is like a region and part of piemonte and so what is this wine why is it so special well, it's a really full-bodied wine um, made from the Nebbiolo grape. Nebbiolo, I always really like this because the word comes from Nebbia, which means fog. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to Piedmont, you'll know that it's often very foggy. And so that's where it took the name from because the grapes were growing in the fog. And it's this really special microclimate with the weather, the soil that allows the Nebbiolo grape in Piedmont to create such a special wine that we know as Barolo. So you can grow Nebbiolo in Australia. In fact, we do. I'm sure in America they grow it as well. 
and it will definitely not taste like the Barolo wine that you have in Piedmont. It's a really quite a difficult grape to work with and the soil conditions, the nebbia, the fog, everything it's above the soil. Yeah, it's just perfect in, in Piedmont. So it produces this really amazing wine. To be considered a Barolo, it's very strict rules and regulations of which probably the most important is that it needs to be aged for at least 38 months, a very long time, and 18 of those months are aged in wood. To be a reserver, so the the most important precious precious, wine, it has to be aged for a whopping 62 months. So it's a (laughs) long, long time, and it must have a high alcohol content of at least 13% or oftentimes higher especially yeah. with you know the weather at the moment being quite hot summers wine is just naturally a higher alcohol percentage so they're kind of the the rules about barolo and how long it has to be aged um, and it's delicious in terms of the flavors you would expect cherry violet rose even tobacco licorice uh, and i think the really special thing about barolo wine is that it's a wine that gets better with age. So when you first, you don't want to open a Barolo right away when, right you, away buy yeah. when you buy it. So right now you can buy the 2019 Barolos, okay? Yeah. You probably don't want to open that one right now. Put it aside and leave a bit of time and opening maybe in a special occasion. Not only, it's always good to open, but it's good to age it for a bit. And in 2024, we can have the 2020s Barolo. And in 2025, we can expect 2021 Barolos to hit the market. Mm. So tell me, what's the oldest Barolo you've ever tried? Mm. That is a very good question. I think, (laughs) if I'm not wrong, we tried one from... I think 2016. 2016, maybe. probably, yeah. And definitely was we tried. Amazing. Which And 2016 is one of the, considered the one of the years. best years of Barolo. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, since we're talking about it, the best vintages, the best years. In recent times. In recent times, of course. You can buy 2010, 2013, and 2016. And also 2019 is considered a good vintage for the good weather that they had. It's all about these conditions, isn't it? And it's just so delicately balanced. Like you can have one thing go wrong and it's off balance. And I just love how when we went to the wineries there and then constantly just monitoring the weather, the environment, everything, I think they've got their finger on the pulse. So it's really incredible to me just how in touch they are not just with the land but with the whole environment and it's so symbiotic to what's happening in their lives and what they're producing and just the passion behind it is incredible really Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's very inspiring, I think, especially when you look at even organic producers in the Barolo region. And they're making things, you know, it's even more difficult because they can't use any of these um, pesticides or things to to help with all the problems with climate change and the weather. So it's just, oh, back-breaking, you know, labour. And they're really, really relying on Mother Nature. So it's quite inspiring, I think, when you visit some of these wineries. It really is. I agree. Yeah, and it's like it's scientific, but there's also a little bit of an art to it because you've got to know when to move and when not to move. When people have got so much passion and have so much knowledge about something, deep, deep knowledge, it's, it is really inspiring. And it's not, in Italy, what I love about the wine is it's not just a standalone activity. It's something that's really in tune with the local culture and the food. So tell us, what do we eat when we drink Barolo? So thanks to the high acidity of this wine, you can pair it easily with fatty cuts of meat like duck or veal or rich sauces. Like, for example, in Piedmont, we have the agnolotti, uh, which is the typical pasta, and you usually eat it with a roast beef sauce. Uh, mm, another yeah. typical um, dish you can eat while you're there is brasato al barolo, which is braised veal, lamb or wild boar. Or another very good thing you can have, especially in autumn, is truffle dishes like traditional tagliarin pasta, which is similar to tagliatelle. You could think about it like that. Or rich mountain butter, fonduta, or strong cheese. They pair very well with cheeses as well. Cheese pairing like Castelmagno, which is typical of Piemonte, or the blue cheese Gorgonzola. 
Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a truffle pasta and then gorgonzola. Oh, my goodness. If I think about the dishes that I'll be like, oh, craving, there, there definitely some of it. And, yeah, you definitely need something that's got a little bit of acid to, to cut through. And somehow you can eat more when you're drinking Barola. I don't know how. Yes. Mm. You'll love this as well. They they describe Barolo as a meditation wine. So yeah. you can even just have it at the end of the meal, you know, curled up in front of a fireplace uh, and have a little bit of meditation time with your glass. But is it an emotional wine? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what you drink. Yeah. <laughs> Olivia and I always have a bit of a joke. In Italy they have these new showers in spa hotels called emotional showers, which we're not. I'm 100% what it, that's all about. But I, for me, the emotion that the Barolo evokes is, is a sense of comfort, actually, and just a sense of being cosy and warm. And, yeah, I think it's not, I don't know if you'd be wanting to drink a Barolo on a, you know, very hot day. I it's think. not like a, your wine. No, definitely not an aperitivo no. wine. It's big bodied and it's very tannic and, yes. yeah, high alcohol. Yeah, but would you say, like, I don't find it as big-bodied as some of the wines that we have here in Australia. That's true. I was expecting something like a big Shiraz, but it wasn't really like that. It's a little bit more subtle and complex, I think. It's not not hitting you in the face like a Shiraz or a Cabernet Sauvignon from the New World. That's true, yeah. Definitely still an old world wine, more... A little bit more elegant maybe, a little bit more refined. Yes, absolutely. And depends as well, as we were talking about, which side of the hill you get your Barolo. Right. Tell us about that. So if we look at, um, I guess, some of the different soil types, that's what influences the flavour, okay? So there's two main soil types in Barolo. One is mostly clay mixed with a bit of sand and limestone, and that's from Lamora and Barolo, the town itself. So if you want a wine that's a little elegant, a little easier to approach, a little less tannin, softer, fruity, you'd pick the Barolos coming from Barolo, the town, or uh, La Mora. Instead, the other soil type um, is really rich in iron. It's comprised mainly of sandstone and sand, and these are producing more austere Barolos, a little bit more tannic, a little harder to approach, um, and they need time. They need a lot of time to soften with age, and then they can be, you know, really um, round and delicious too. And so if you'd like that, you'd be looking at Monforte d'Alba and Serra Lunga d'Alba um, as the Barolos where where you choose your Barolo from. And the wine producer in this uh latter kind of soil are easy to age you can easily age them for 12 to 15 years even so yeah Barolo, big aging potential yes exactly but is a good wine the, to sell it gets better with age so sell it really well thanks to its high acidity and powerful tannins and is there a tradition andrea when you know like if you're when you're born that they buy a nice <laughs> bottle and sell it it's always a nice thing to do. Uh, I remember my grandma had a little cellar where she had wine from when I was born and like years of special occasions, like, for example, something special that happened with her husband or the graduation of her, her son. So, yes, it's definitely a good thing to do. You buy, you store it away, and after some years you open it when it's mm. aged and refined. Lovely. I love those traditions. I think that's a really nice. I mean, why not? Just, oh, oh, hang on a minute. I'm just going to grab my bottle of Barolo from the cellar. I celebrate it twice. When you buy it for the special occasion, when you open yeah, it, you exactly. celebrate it again. That's true. You Piemontese, you love a party. I can <laughs> and, and a very nice glass of wine, which is Oh, I found it a very nice place to visit. <laughs> now, I know people are thinking, hmm, this is sounding really good. Uh, where can we go in La Lange and the Barolo wine region to taste these amazing wines? So there's so many delicious wineries. Yeah. However, just as a disclaimer, with wineries in Italy, we've mentioned it before, you always need an appointment. So don't just turn up. Exactly. Uh, so as long as you know that, you're good to go. So Three wineries that we wanted to recommend to you. The first one 
is a really famous one called Borgogno, and it's in the town of Barolo itself. So this is quite an easy one to visit. Um, however, you'll be visiting the cellar door, so it's not a working winery, obviously, because it's right in the middle of town. But yeah. it's a beautiful experience. We've gone for a tasting there because they have a panoramic terrace that looks out over all the hills, and it's just, yeah, lovely, um, lovely scenery as you sip on your Barolo. They show you also the cellars. They have huge cellars. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's true. Beautiful wooden castles. Underground, caskets. Yes. yeah, it's beautiful. And then you can visit the castle after. Yeah, Barolo. it's literally opposite of the castle and mm-hmm. close by. Yeah, so that's the first one. The then second we have one? Cantina Maccarello, which is a really historic and famous producer, and it's as well in Barolo. So if you want to visit the town itself and have more than one visit, you can book them both. They're in the same place. Otherwise, the last one is uh, in Serra Lunga, so this other village, and it's called Massolino. And that's a really nice winery too. And Serra Lunga is a beautiful town to visit because they also have a castle. So <laughs> in Piedmont, there's no shortage of good wine and castles. <laughs> mm, and good restaurants too. It's one of those places where you could easily spend like a weekend or, you know, several days exploring because there's a lot of beautiful sites to see, castles, and there's a very colourful chapel there too, right? Yeah, so yeah. the Barolo Chapel. That is located just near La Mora, actually. At we the go foot there. of the hill, yeah. Yeah, we go there on our tours um, for Untold Italy and it's really, you can't go inside the chapel but it's like a photo stop. It's this multicoloured chapel in the middle of the vineyards. Like you cannot get more picturesque than the Barolo <laughs> Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a particular time of year that's good to visit? Because I know, Liv, you've done Vendemia there, which is the harvest, and I can imagine that's really, really busy <laughs> at that time of year. Yeah. So is there a better time of year, or not even not a better time, but I'm, I'm sure it's a different experience depending on when you go. Yeah, we really like spring as a time to visit yes. because um, all the flowers are blooming. Uh, it's a really pretty in the vineyards. There's less people. It's also less expensive. So fall is high, high season, as you mentioned, Katie. So prices are obviously at a premium. There's a truffle, white truffle season going on. So it's very expensive. It gets booked out, you know, well in advance. So spring is a really great alternative. Mm-hmm. It's still crisp mornings and nice sunny days. I wouldn't really recommend summer just because, as we say, you know, Barolo is a big wine and it's, it does get really hot in Piedmont in the summertime yeah. too. So, yeah, we, I would say spring. Absolutely. I loved it there. I was there in spring, wasn't I? And I was just like, oh, Barolo wine, cute towns, chocolate, yum. <laughs> the snow as well on the Alps in the distance, yeah. which is pretty. That is super pretty. And I have to tell you, do you know what I found today in my desk drawer? <laughs> this is just an aside. I found a little guanduya. Oh, oh. I, I thought I struck gold. So for everyone that's listening, <laughs> this is like a special chocolate from Piemonte. And I was like cleaning up my drawer and they come in these tiny little nuggets. Yeah. And I found one and it was from Gabino. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Good day. It was a very good day indeed, I have to say. But now we were very lucky because we had Andrea's mum driving us around. (laughs) So (laughs) you do need a car to get around this area, don't you? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only place that you can visit with the train is Alba. That's a city, okay, so you're not going to be out in the vineyards there. It's a very nice town, you know, worth visiting. But if you want to go to the vineyards and to these little towns, you absolutely need a car, a driver. That's the other thing is if you're going to be doing wine tasting, you don't really want to be driving either, right? Hire a driver. So a driver or go on a tour. Actually, uh, I was talking to Corinna uh, last week and she mentioned that the rules have changed about driving and having alcohol lately in Italy, and I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but I'm, I need to look into it because, yeah, I think it's 0.05. Uh, yes. yeah, yeah, that sounds about right, same as in Australia, which is really you can have one glass of wine and you need to sit on that for a couple of hours, you know. So it's just not fun. You don't want to be worrying about that. You want to be enjoying the scenery, enjoying the wine and, you know, not worrying about getting stopped by police because I don't think that's very, very fun at all. <laughs> I mean, really, thanks to your mum because it was a really big treat she gave us. She doesn't drink wine, so she's the perfect designated uh. driver. 
<laughs> How do we manage to get things in our families? I think we're just very clever. But I think if you, you know, maybe were going to drive or someone was driving or you were doing a bit of a road trip, because I do always like to think a road trip through Piemonte and Liguria and through southern France is just a very good idea. But um, if you were driving, you could stop in La Mora or one of these towns because they have these beautiful wine bars where you can try the cantinas, right, where you can try a lot of different producers there as well. It's just maybe not the same as walking in the vineyards and, and seeing the production methods. Yes, exactly. Yep. But that's true. They do have lots of Enotec uh, so you can pop in and, and buy a bottle of wine and or do some wine tasting. Yes, exactly. Do you remember the name of this one in Lamora that was really cute? I remember there's a that big vista panoramic terrace and then you've got you just walk down a little bit and there's a the Nenateca there where they've got I think it's a consortium. Yeah, it's the Cantina Comunale, is the like city city council run cantina where you can buy the wine. The produced in the area. It's very nice. As you said, it's beautiful because in La Morra, one of these villages, you have this beautiful terrace overlooking all the hills and the Alps. And just walking down this narrow road, you find it on your left, this beautiful Cantina Comunale where you can buy all the wine that you like. And if you're wondering about prices, since we're talking about buying bottles, uh, mm. to give you some examples, the 2019 uh, so, Barolo. So this vintage, so what, exactly. what's just been on the market. Yeah. It can be found around 50 euros. That's already for a good Barolo. If you go back to 2017, for example, for a good bottle of wine, you could spend up to 300 euros. Yeah. So the trick is you buy it when it's first released exactly. and then you put it away for a couple of yes. years. And then, yeah, I mean, you can even you can sell them or you can obviously pop them open and drink them. Yeah. Oh, that's why I'm getting my wine fridge. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Because you need to store it correctly Wood too. Wood yes. Mm. At this cantina, I'm sure this is possible, but you, there's not just Barolo, is there? They have different, a lot of different varieties of wine in the region. And, uh, you know, I think when we were there, we found a really nice Nebbiolo leaf that we were like, wow, this is amazing, so easy to drink and so delicious. So what, what other types of wines are there? So there's a lot uh, in the area, which is great. So Obviously, we'll start with the Nebbiolo one that you mentioned. It's called Lange Nebbiolo. So it's just produced in the whole Lange region, so um, extending the borders of, of where the Barolo region is. So it's the same grape, but there's different rules and regulations, not required to be aged for as long, a little bit more approachable, a bit more ready to drink now. It's a great I guess. wine by itself, by the way. I love it. Like It's easier to drink than Barolo if you want to approach it. You want something easy but still very tannic, acid, and good to pair with the food we mentioned before. Nebbiolo is a very good choice. I agree. Something a little bit easier would be the Barbera d'Alba. So, again, mm. it's like a medium to full-bodied, a much lower price point. Yeah. It's still really fruity as well, so cherries, dark fruits, herbaceous. Yeah, I love a Barbera. That's the more like a, that's a, a typical, daily drinking wine. That's a typical drinking wine that you could could have found on every Piemonte table mm. for a lunch or a dinner in every house. Uh, it's a typical drinking wine of every day. It's very good, though. Mm. I love it. Um, something as well that I think gets overlooked and maybe isn't known, <laughs> but definitely isn't known as much as Barolo. So if Barolo you consider it as the king, you can think of the queen of the region as the Barbaresco. So Barbaresco is like just up from Barolo. Um, so Alba is between the region of Barolo and Barbaresco. And those wines are made from Nebbiolo as well, but they're a little softer, they're more elegant, less tannic. So again, a bit more approachable too. And generally speaking, a little more affordable than the Barolo. And again, it takes the name from the little village of Barbaresco itself. And to give you an idea this wine it's very good but can be produced just in three little villages so mm -hmm. Neve, Barbaresco and Terezo so it's a very very small area but it makes a beautiful wine mm -hmm. again from the Nebbiolo grape and I think if you like white wine Piedmont is not you know renowned for its white wines although there are some that we absolutely love. Yes. But talking about this area specifically within the Lange, the Arnaise is the white wine. So they also call it the white Barolo. It's quite tropical, um, stone fruit flavours, honey, apple. So if you're more of a white drinker, you'd go for the Arnaise. But, I mean, 
Piedmont is a red wine lover's dream. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, funnily enough, I really struggle drinking the really full-bodied red wines from Australia, but I don't have any problem having the red wines from Italy, especially Piemonte, because it's, I don't know, it's a different method, the soil, who knows, but, you know, I'm definitely able to sleep and have a good night's rest on on a nice Barola or Barbaresco. But, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it, how these traditions have evolved around these specific varieties and how important they've been. And I think there's definitely a connection between the Barolo being known as the king of wines and having that royal background in Piemonte and the history of the royal family being there. Absolutely, yes. In fact, it's called the King of Wine and it was produced uh, when there was the king in Turin because uh, in the region in Turin there was the first king of Italy. And the story goes, one of the two versions is that Barolo became produced as we know it today under the tutelage, we can say, of the first prime minister of Italy, which was very close to the king, which was Conte Camillo Benso di Cavour, which, by the way, has a castle that you can visit in the region. We visit it on our tours, actually. (laughs) The very pretty one, too. It is, yes. And we asked a French enologist called Louise Houdard to improve the quality of the wine and to create a dry version of Barolo similar to the one we have today. Uh, And then it became popular with Piedmont aristocracy and leading to the catchphrase Barolo, the wine of kings, the king of wines. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something interesting to note that traditionally Barolo wasn't how we had it today. It was sweet. It really just became the wine that we know it during the late 1800s. So that's the first version. But I kind of like the second version of the story because it says that a woman was responsible for creating Barolo, which Katie and I love. Uh, Juliette, and you can say her name. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the original name is Juliette Colbert de Moulouvier, but everyone in Torino call it Julia di Barolo. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it's an easier one. And she's known as the Marquesa or the Marquesa of Barolo. And basically she was a noble woman. And when her husband died, she inherited the Folletti family vineyards. Her palate, you know, she was used to drinking uh, French wines, a little bit more uh, austere, thanks to the French nobility. So she didn't like the sweet Barolo. It wasn't to her palate. And so she called the same enologist that Andrea mentioned before, Louis, and asked him to make a dry version, which was more to her palate. So I quite like that version of the story too. Yeah, there's so many little stories behind it, but look what they've done and it's grown into this huge industry and when people come from all around the world, especially wine connoisseurs, to experience the magic of Barolo. Now, Liv and Andrea, thanks for sharing this beautiful region with us. I really did very much enjoy going to see it for myself and experiencing it. It's one of those places where you're not going to see a lot of English-speaking tourists and although Olivia and I, did go to a restaurant and bump into someone from around the corner in Melbourne. It was really quite strange. But typically speaking, you're not really going to bump into anyone from English-speaking countries, and that's really part of the charm, I think. You know, you really have that beautiful experience of this long tradition, and it's not a tourist zone. It's definitely a place where they're just doing what they're doing because they like doing it, and it's a really lovely place because of that. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. We love we love Piedmont. Oh, I'm a bit biased, of course, <laughs> but yes. Well, next time I have to go there with you, Andrea, because you were missing in action that day. Yes, I show you around. <laughs> I can't wait. All right. So, Liv and Andrea, thank you so much for sharing beautiful Piemonte, Le Lange and Barolo with us. Would you let everyone know how they can stay in touch with you if they want to learn some more? Absolutely. So you can find our website, italianwinetales.com. We're on Instagram and we also have our Facebook group, Italian Wine Lovers. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. And are you going to be having a Barolo for Christmas dinner? Because we're recording this. You know it. (laughs) It's ready to be popped. Yeah, we've got one. We've had it aging for a while, so I think it might be time time to pop it over. Yes. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you so much for coming back on Untold Italy and we'll see you next time for another wine region. I think we might be heading south this time. Grazie mille, Katie. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.
I hope you enjoyed our journey together into Piedmont via the very drinkable Barolo wine. As I mentioned earlier, it was my first trip to this region earlier in uh, 2023, and I loved how genuinely passionate the winemakers we met were about not only their processes, but also the way their wine built a deep connection to the local landscape and community. Of course, you'll meet these locals and try the amazing Barolo wine on our spring and fall tours of beautiful Piedmont, led by Olivia herself. Apart from trying this amazing wine, we introduce you to Elegant Turin, where Andrea grew up and Liv spent two years getting to know. If you're someone who likes the finer things in life and European elegance, this trip is for you. It's a whole world away from the wonderful chaos of Italy's southern regions and offers refined dining, wine tasting and more. You can check out the itinerary on our website at untolditalytours.com. And as always, we've provided a full list of the wines and places mentioned, as well as a link to the Piedmont Tours into our detailed show notes for this episode found at untolditaly.com forward slash 206 for episode 206. Make sure you have a poke around our website while you're there. There are hundreds of articles designed to help you build your dream trip to Italy. We're very proud of this information that we send out into the world. It's based on a love for Italy and checked regularly, so you know it's up to date. Thank you, grazie, to all our wonderful listeners for your ongoing support of Untold Italy. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, then it would be amazing if you gave us a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. If you're using Apple Podcasts, then you need to go to the show page for Untold Italy, not the episode page. That works in Spotify too. You can leave your review a message there. We really love seeing them. On next week's episode, we're taking another virtual trip to beautiful Italy to discover exactly what makes us want to return again and again. But until then, it's ciao for now. The Untold Italy podcast is an independent production. Podcast editing, audio production and website development by Mark Hatter. Production assistance and content writing by the other Katie Clark. Yes, there are two of us. For more information about Untold Italy, please visit untolditaly.com. 